Thank you all for joining Luxury Institute's webinar on high-touch healthcare in a time of uncertainty. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared after today's session. The recording will also be available on Luxury Institute's website and our YouTube channel. Please share any of your questions using the Q&A box located on your screen and we'll address as many questions as we can in the last 15 to 10 minutes of the session. If you would like to connect privately to ask any questions or share your feedback, all contact details will be provided. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's moderator and our host, Milton Pedraza, Luxury Institute CEO, and our guest speaker, Dr. Jordan Schlain, private medical founder and CEO. Milton? Katie, thank you very much. Uh, some people might wonder why Luxury Institute is holding a webinar on medicine, and particularly the current state of medicine and the future of medicine. I always like to tell the story that a lot of innovation, a lot of entrepreneurship, and a lot of mainstream uh, adoption occurs from the fact that at the high end of any category, there are innovations, there are entrepreneurs that uh, take the risk, take the chance, and create new ideas, new practices, and that's what we have today. In medicine, uh, I'm thrilled to have and excited to get into the conversation, Dr. Jordan Schlain who is the uh, founder and the CEO and a deep in the practice physician uh, at Private Medical. Um, Jordan, I, uh, what I would love to ask you to do is to give us a, a, um, a little bit of a brief on your career journey and your life journey and about Private Medical, please. Thank you, Milton, and thank all of you for joining today. I hope this is, uh, illuminates um, the world of what the healthcare system is gonna look like. Um, probably after the pandemic more so. Um, so briefly, I, I was born the son of a surgeon and uh, my father and my mother was a psychologist. So my father was cut it out and let's fix it. And my mom was, let's sit on the couch and talk about it forever. So I grew up with these two, two different the, you know, themes growing up. And, and my father told me when I was born, son, you can be whatever you want when you grow up as long as you're a doctor. So, so I didn't really have a choice. I mean, I kind of did, but kind of didn't. And, um, you know, fast forward, I, I, I went to uh, Berkeley undergrad. I took a year off and taught uh, high school in Africa, in Kenya, and, and uh, in Swahili. Went to Georgetown for medical school. Came back and, you know, en entered the realm of medicine in 1997 in San Francisco when the HMO machine was in full swing. And, you know, I spent one year out of training as a doctor in that gear grinding, treadmill, fatigue, doctor story, patient every 10 minutes. And I, I just was like, this, this is not my destiny. Like I care about people and I can't care 10 minutes. So um, I wound up quitting um, my job at, you know, that my father was like totally flummoxed that I would do that. Um, and I didn't know what I was gonna do with my life. And I walked into a, a, a hotel lobby in downtown San Francisco to collect my thoughts. And I, and I realized very quickly that I was sitting in the Mandarin Oriental Hotel and that was kind of above my pay grade at the time. And I walked up to the concierge and said, hey, who's the doctor for this hotel when somebody gets sick? And she said, who are you? And I said, well, I could be the doctor for that hotel, for your, for your guests. And she said, doctor, this is a five-star hotel. And oh, by the way, she said, I'm, I'm a concierge, so I'm, I'm two-star smart. But everything we do is five-star service from the linens to the lunches to the limos to everything else. She said, if you're a doctor, you're probably five-star smart, but you guys do one-star service. And if you want to be the doctor to my guests, you need to do five-star service. Now, she didn't realize I just quit my job like an hour before. So I asked her, I said, look, teach me. Could you teach me what five-star service means to you? And that is the beginning of this journey of how I um, came to understand that what they do in hospitality, and I think a lot of other luxury realms is pay attention to the people in front of you, listen, follow up, follow through, present options, be humble, um, but, and been have expertise. And so I have, since 1998 have been, and so I started a practice with no patients from scratch in San Francisco. What year was it? This was in 1998. Wow, okay. Um, and have been just iterating on how do I provide, because ultimately if you're a person, you're connected to a family. Like you've got a brother and a sister and a mom and a dad and maybe some kids. And, and right now you see your pediatrician over there, you see your, 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 your internist over there, you see your gynecologist over there. I'm like, how do you bring that all under one roof? How do you make it so a person has a place that they trust, they know is safe, 
they know has your back. They're on the same side of the financial ledger as you. They're not making money off doing things. It's non-transactional, it's relational. You know, it, 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 20 years later, um, like I think I've cracked the code on how to do this. And it's, a, it, it's been through a lot of listening. Um, but you, you just have to, you know, meet people where they are, both physically, mentally, and medically. Um, and, and that's kind How of, many clinics do you have? How many? So, so we now have uh, our, our flagship. Our first office was in San Francisco. That's where I am now. We opened up in Silicon Valley with all the Silicon Valley tech folks, you know, coming online wanting service. And then we opened up in Beverly Hills in 2015. We opened up Manhattan in 2019. Uh, we currently have waiting lists um, to get in. Um, COVID kind of did a little bit of that because now people are, are realizing if I have more money than time or if I have all these resources and I don't have my health, like what, what, what is, what is, you know, health, uh, what is wealth without health, you know? So COVID is a big part of your practice right now. Obviously it's, it affects all our lives. Yeah. Tell us a little bit then about the current state of the pandemic and the current state or the current and evolving state of cures, vaccines, uh, you tell us. Yeah, so, so I, would, I would double click out for one second before I dive into the, those details. And okay. I would say we have a, we need a vaccine for misinformation because, hmm. because that is the number one problem we have. Uh, what we didn't do at the beginning is say, wear a mask, save your job save the economy. What we said is wear a mask and save someone else's life. And we live in a country over here in the United States where libertarian streak, don't tread on me. Like altruism, altruism isn't our strong suit, unfortunately, like it is in European countries and Scandinavian countries and even Asian countries where like New Zealand said, when, when this happened, New Zealand said, we need to build a team of 5 million people to be on the same team to defeat this. That was their messaging. They were all on the same team, no matter what, whether you were Republican or Democrat, you, you found this same team thesis. We, we didn't do that. And, and all of a sudden, like all this crazy information was flying around and, and now nobody really knows what's going on and nobody knows what the truth really is because it's hard to discern. The scientist says this, it, dis it gets discredited by somebody else, but there's a real truth to the reason to discredit it because we're trying to push science through like warp speed when it, it, it can only occur over minutes and, and hours and days and weeks and months. You can't speed it up. You can throw more resources at it, but time only goes so fast and experiments can only be run so fast. So, so that's my high level. But as you zoom into today, like where are we at? Um, I'm super bummed out at the, at, of how chaotic it is. I mean, the United States is a hot mess um, all over the place. Um, we're gonna enter the fall. Um, and my prediction is, is that um, there's going to be a Labor Day weekend where you're going to see all the shenanigans again that we saw on Memorial Day weekend, people going out, you know, hmm. they're, they're, they're prioritizing leisure over the health of children and their grandparents, sadly. And, and then you're going to see a spike shortly after Labor Day. But that spike is not coming from Labor Day. It's coming from right now when schools reopen. And so we're going to get confused which happens all the time because we live in this world where you press a button and something shows up at your door the next day. So we live in the Amazon one click one day, internet, super fast, make it happen now. But, but viruses are <laughs> like three weeks before you press the button and something shows up kind of a thing. And we don't have that framework in our head. Um, the good news is that I was just on a webinar this morning with Stanford and Oxford. You know, the, the, there are a lot of medications, therapeutics, that are coming online. We know that dexamethasone, which costs like a penny, will help if you're getting close to a ventilator. We know that they're like aspirin and some blood clotting tools can help because that we do think there's a blood clotting component to this. So, and, so that's on the therapeutic side. And I think that we're gonna have a composite framework within a few months, because there's all these studies that are finally wrapping up and we're getting some good conclusions that you know, by, by mid fall, we'll know what the cocktail of things that we can use in the early stages, the middle phases, and the late stages of, of if you have it. Now that's treatment. That, that's hopeful. That's hopeful. So that's so yeah. So I'm I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic that we're gonna we're getting a lot of good science now. Um, uh, that's on the treatment. On the testing, um, that's still a bit of a of of, a, of another hot mess. Um, just because all these people originally came out with tests, they didn't work. And so where I'm landing on on testing is um, 
and if you understand Bayesian, Bayesian um, math, is if we had a test that was only 50% effective, so flip a coin, it, you have it, I mean, uh, more than flip a coin, because if, it, if it's positive, then you know it's real, but if it's negative, you don't. Like that's the 50-50. The if we can get a cheat test that we can do on every other day, that's only 50% sensitive, that, that's really good. Because ultimately, if you test positive, you need to take yourself out of circulation and you need to quarantine for two weeks. Right. And it's, you know, wear a mask and, and like, that's the hard part for anybody who's got like this believer in freedom. Like, don't take my freedom away, but you're gonna take someone else's freedom away if you don't like, you know. So, so I think the testing is, I've got a friend up in Boston right now at MIT, he's building a new, he's trying to build a $10, 15 minute disposable test um, I'm, I'm hooking them up with some Silicon Valley, you know, people to see if we can operationalize that because the technology, there's a new technology called LAMP, I won't go into it, but um, that we think we can get there. So the real, the real um, watershed moment in, 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 in COVID is when we can do testing at scale because then mm -hmm. all the kids in school, they spit in a thing and you wait and if you're positive, you go home and if you're negative, you go to school. And that's sports, that's businesses, that's everything. And so you just wait 15 minutes, which I hope people can do. But once we have that easy test that's everywhere, you'll be able to get into businesses, you'll be able to go do stuff in stores, even stores will make you do it. And I think it'll become a new normal. Like everyone's waiting, when are we gonna get back to normal? Well, we're not getting back to normal. The evolution never goes back to the way it was. It always evolves into something else. So I think for the next year or two, and on the subject of vaccines, um, that's far away. Like the Russia thing, nobody believes that in, in the scientific community. Like that's, nobody believes that. And so there's no chance that skipping that, let's say that third part, uh, they can accelerate it and maybe get lucky or it, will it take just luck for them to be able to use that vaccine and have it work? So the, the, the issue with vaccine is, is, is if I make a vaccine, I give it to a, a million people or a thousand people. Like if it's, <laughs> if it's, so it's either it doesn't work and it didn't harm anybody, that's, that's cool. But if it doesn't work and it harms people, that's not, that's not okay. And if it does work, but it harms an equal number of people that it helped, that doesn't work. And you can't know that a priori. You need to run the experiment with large numbers of people. So if you skip a thing, like I'm telling people, I'm not joining that vaccine. I'm not, I, don't take the vaccine. Let, let 100,000 people go through the vaccine process to get the safety profile before you get it. Like I have a woman, one of our, one of our clients in New York, she goes, I want to be the first one to get the vaccine. I'm like, no, you don't. Um, you want to wait. You, you, I mean, it's just a gamble. Like it, it's rolling the dice on something that, that I think is not worth rolling the dice on. So doctor, what's realistic in terms of getting a vaccine, producing it, and then average people such as our audience, uh, you know, actually being inoculated? Um, so like the normal process for developing a vaccine is like 10 to 15 years. I mean, FYI, we're, you know, we're trying to do, you know, that, that, that's every vaccine that's been developed has taken that long. I get it, um, but there's a lot of vaccines being thrown up there, you know, uh, so that hopefully there'll be an increase in, pro in probability. Well, no, I, I think, I think what we're seeing, the meta message about what this, uh, uh, pandemic is doing to the scientific community is it's making us collaborate more. It's making us like look at regulations that were like all about safety, way over to the side of safety and not speed. And like the risk is if you go all the way to speed, you, you totally compromise safety. So we have to have an honest conversation about how do we find a middle, which is good because the FDA and all these processes are so oriented to safety. And that makes sense because you have a bunch of people die on something, then you're going to go, you keep going more to safety. And we've, we've just never had a reason to go back the other way. And as soon as you do, all the people who had people who died because of a irresponsible experiment will say, you know, no way. Um, so I, but I, I think a vaccine, I think we'll see some promise stuff in Q1, Q2 of next year. Okay. Okay. That's well, probably that's cool. That's hopeful. And, and it's important to touch on this topic. What I want to talk about, is, a, a, an overarching topic is the future of medicine, because you are an innovator. I've mm -hmm. spoken with you many times and we've talked about not just the service, but the technology and the innovation that you're using with your patients and that you're seeing. And so um, if, if, if I said to you in a broad question, so how do you see the future of healthcare for the average person? 
beginning maybe uh, with the wealthy being the first to do it and subsidizing the mainstream and technology's role in that. So the future and the technology's role. Let's start the conversation and I'll just pepper you with a few questions here. Sure. So I think at the first uh, pass is if we look at the healthcare system today or yesterday um, before the pandemic, um, we have to be honest and say this system was not designed. It's not like I'm building a company or I'm going to build a new thing and I'm going to design it. This is, we started off with hospitals in the 18th century to put the sickest people. We didn't even know what disease was. A new technology, x-rays come along. We've just slapped on process after process after process. Doctors have taken a Hippocratic oath. Companies take an oath to shareholders. You have a big problem right there. That is the fundamental problem. Do companies care about the patient that the, the do no harm? Or do companies care about profits? Do companies even care about patients that are in the space of healthcare? So that's the high level thing that I'm, I'm trying to tackle, which is I, in my mind's eye, everyone should take a Hippocratic Oath. If you're a company in the space, you should take a Hippocratic Oath. So I've re rewrote, the, the, I mean, I, I'm rewriting the Hippocratic Oath because it hasn't been updated in about 2000 years and it's probably worth taking a look at it, right? Um, so I gave a talk in London a while about like, if we were gonna re, uh, reimagine designing a system, we should start with a paradigm, which is we are all in it to help people, not in it to make money. I mean, you can make money too, I'm cool with that, but you gotta help people in the process. And right now they're, they're, it, we're kind of running amok. So, so from that design principle of we're all in this together, um, I, the, the doctor, need to orient everything I do around your good outcome. So, so my income should be predicated on your outcome. And if my income, so, so, I mean, who would argue with that, right? But in the current system, my income is predicated on transactions. The more I do for you, the more money I make. The more surgeries I do, the more money I make. The more supplements, the more prescriptions, the more... The, and, and so we're, we're in this kind of universe right now where it's all transactional. There's not, it's not relational. And, you know, and I think going back to your point about where does luxury come in or where does the high end come in? These people want something that feels high trust, high relationship, like, and high safety in the medical realm. Like, I think they want that in a Ferrari too, right? They want that thing to be safe or a Tesla. So, yeah. so these are the design principles that need to go into it. And, you know, what, what, what I've done is, is just said, look, I'm going to be on the same side of the ledger as my members, my patients. I'm not going to mark anything up. If I recommend something and I have no, I have no financial interest in anything that I do, take the financial incentives away and make it about a, uh, you know, Aristotle came up with the term um, that was misunderstood. People thought it was happiness, but we act, but when you actually interpret it in Greek, it was flourishing. And mm -hmm. so how do you enable people to flourish? Um, love that term. And it's a different thing than happiness, uh, but very, I mean, they overlap a lot. So, you know, so in my mind is you, you have to, you have to understand who people are. You have to meet people where they are, you know, and like I said earlier, both medically mentally and physically. Um, and, and once you can spend that time on the front end to know people, you can design something specifically for them because the current system of evidence-based medicine, which is a very well uh, used term, and, it, and it, there's no evidence for evidence-based medicine when you're, <laughs> dealing with an, when you're dealing with an individual. So evidence-based medicine takes care of populations, and that's been the way it's been done. We did a big study. It said you should get amoxicillin if you're if you need a, a dental procedure and you've got a mitral valve prolapse or something, right? And so that's what the evidence says. But if you look at the the graph of that evidence that was 10,000 people, 80% of the people it worked, and 10% on this side it didn't, 10% on this side it didn't. So mm -hmm. the the, the evidence-based medicine and population-based uh, uh, programs, which which are good for the whole, that's like version one. You have to zero into you. Who are you in that population? And how do I tailor an approach to you? That requires time, it requires big data, it requires, a, that's where the technology comes in, is how do you then start to come up with a FICO score for you? And then how do you build a roadmap for your future to how to get the be a better score? And how does new information as it comes in from the scientific community flow into that GPS to help you navigate so you continue to get a better score. So let me ask you this. You, you know, I'm a big proponent of personal data rights. I'm an investor in personal data economy. 
which yes. has a lot of components to it. Yes. But every time I reach to research the topic, healthcare and medical data, genetic data, Fitbit data, your consumption, dietary consumption data, and other data, even your data that can project your mental state like your texts comes up. And I see that I, I read a lot about it, but what is it going to take? Tell us, navigate us to that process. What is what does the current state look like? What does the end state look like? And how do we get there? So the current state is a hot mess. Uh, you don't own your data. You don't know where it is. People are making millions. I wrote an article years ago called "Who's Your Sugar Data," <laughs> and, and and basically it said that in healthcare, you know, the way I think about this, and and I'm going to go a little on a tangent, but but work with me. I'm a musician in my spare time. I play music. So when I grab my guitar, I've got all sorts of notes, A, B, B sharp, B flat. These notes are free. Anybody can use those notes. But when I write a song, I can copyright that and that's mine. Hmm. And no one else can use it, but the notes are free, right? Yeah. So you as a health, an individual, your blood pressure is, is, is just a data point, right? For you and your temperature and your mental state. Like I could come up with 80 biomarkers in your blood test. Those are, Absent any context, they don't mean anything. But once I come up with Milton Pedraza's song with the data, you should own that. That should be yours. And if anybody wants to use that for anything, you should, like a music rights, you should get syndicated rights to that. And if, and if, and if you want to donate your data to science, you should be able to donate it to data. If you want to sell it to pharma, they should pay you to use it. And so one of the key tenets of my new Hippocratic Oath, which I'll send you the, the it's a 10 minute, 15 minute talk I gave in London. Is, the but... first thing is, or, or the first thing is, is know your patient. The second one is you don't own the data. The patient owns the data. And every mm -hmm. click with, in, in a patient's journey through the healthcare system, they should be asked, would you like to donate your data? Would you like to keep it private? Or would you like to sell it? Um, and, and like at every click, at every spot, Thing you do, you should be asked that question. Yeah. And that should be- And we believe Jordan, that there should be a fiduciary representing you so that your legal, ethical, and financial rights- Well, that's gonna happen. I believe, and so I've been beating the drum on this thing for years, um, but the healthcare, so there's so much money to be made in healthcare data right now that you're gonna have to like David and Goliath, those guys to the ground um, before they cough up anything that remotely resembling. But, but I think the answer is, is, is uh, as I use the concept of reverse shaming, um, is, you know, if you start highlighting people, if you can get some companies that do it and you create the hall of fame, then you create the wall of shame. And so I believe that through social pressure, the companies that agree to like, let you make the choice about your healthcare data uh, just like we invest in companies uh, or in ETFs that don't have oil and gas because we're green and whatever, you're going to be able to, companies are going to say, I'm going to use that health insurance plan because they don't steal my patient, my employee's data. And then every other person that does, you say, well, they don't, and they'll, there'll be a pressure for everyone to do this. But I think that's a, a 10 year <laughs> process to, to do this. And that's kind of part of the, will companies take a Hippocratic oath? And so when consumers are able to aggregate and have data rights, sometimes you can't own your data. Somebody said to me, look, Social Security Administration issues you a Social Security number. It's yours, but you don't own it, but you do have rights to it. So let's talk about data rights. When we are able to aggregate all those streams of data from all those different sources that we described, what does medicine look like then? So what medicine looks like is um, the way I think about it, and I said it earlier, is you get a portfolio approach to risk. Because ultimately what we want in our lives is to live our lives without entering the healthcare system, uh, without having some cancer sneak up on us or some stroke sneak up on. Nobody wants to get sideswiped by a healthcare issue because it totally derails the, their existence. And by the way, yeah. we live for 4,000 weeks just to put a fine point on it. Like that's, that's what we get. And so like, you don't want to get shortchanged by 50 weeks or, or 20 weeks. And so my thesis is you can see stuff coming a mile away if you're looking. And so, and, and the, when I say, if you're looking um, for the, I don't know who, who really is on this call, but if you made a million dollar investment in a, or $10 million investment in a company, you would not have a board meeting once a year. And you would not look at a spreadsheet once a year and say, oh, I'm just going to look at it once a year. And, and the rest, I just hope everything's like, if hope is your strategy for your health, 
you're gonna you're gonna be sadly um, shocked by the thing that come, how come I got cancer? Well, I could have known a priori that you had high risk for cancer, and I could have set a screening program for you to look for it on a much more regular basis than once a year, every five years, or whatever they say for colon cancer screening or melanoma screening. And and by the way, age matters. And I see a question coming in about uh, genetic uh, data and intergenerational vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can get that data. You can understand your risk and you can check your kids. You can check other people. You, you know, you, we do that all the time. I mean, we, private medical teamed up with Harvard and the Broad Institute and we, I mean, we co-founded a company, but like we were just the, how do you make it work? It's called Geno Medical. And you can go get like a very sophisticated genetic test through that company. We don't have nothing to do with it anymore. We just help them productize it because it's, it's, you know, it's all sorts of crazy information that people are getting for the first time. And we have the luxury of time here to work with people to understand how do you present this? How do you answer questions? How do we, how do we make this work for at scale? Um, and I did that because I want to be able to offer this test to my people. I don't need to make money off of that. I want to be how able to test like that cost these days today in today's so I, I think when it started, they were charging like five grand. I think it's down to two grand now, well, but, but, it's, it's but maybe it's even less. I haven't talked to them in ages, but, um, but you, Geno Medical, go online, check them out. I mean, I think I think even insurance companies are starting to pay for it now, I think. So what happens after I get my test results from Geno Medical? What kinds of things will I learn? And what happens after that to help Okay, so, so I did it. So it's scary, I a, I'll, What's that? It can be scary. Well, so look, um, everything can be scary, but but knowledge, date, knowledge is power, right? Knowledge is like empowering. And so if you want to stick your head in the sand and say, I would rather not look at scary data, or I'd like to look at scary data that I can actually, so we don't, so what I, what I told Geno Medical is I'm not doing a test that will tell you you're at risk for something that medicine can't do anything about. So I don't want that test included. I only want actionable things. Hmm. So we came up with a hundred actionable things based on all the genomic science in the world. And, you know, and some of them are super random and rare, but let me tell you a story about the random and rare. So I have a guy, 45 years old, runs a multifamily office with all these big families. And, you know, he's pre pandemic, he's on planes, having fancy dinners, traveling around the world. And, you know, but because he's always eating really well, because he's always at these fancy restaurants and whatever, he's always working out really hard because he has to work out to work off the food that he ate the night before. He doesn't drink that much, but, but, you know, he's a schmoozer and, and he likes to eat and, and so the way he keeps his weight down is he, is he, he goes to that treadmill and he just to the gym and a trainer and pushes himself. So we did this genome medical test on him and it turns out he had this rare cardiac uh, abnormality, genetic abnormality that said, if you work out too hard and you get your heart rate up too high, over time, your heart becomes baggy and it turns into a cardiomyopathy and then you wind up with a heart transplant. Jesus. Wow. And so I was like, holy smokes, I never even heard of that one. I mean, I saw it on the list. So we called up the guy that does all the research on this gene in Italy, in Milan, and he's got a whole lab on this. I got my patient on the phone. We got Harvard on the phone. We were like surprised that we found this. They're super rare. But, you know, you check enough people, you're going to find stuff. So then we had to check his kids to see if they had it. Wow. Right? So it turns out his kids don't have it. And it turns out he can't go to the gym anymore and work out. He has to do like walks, which means that he can't eat like he used to eat. He had to change his life. Wow. wow. Otherwise he would gain weight and have another set of problems. So like, that's just one small thing that, you know, and by the way, he has to get MRIs of his heart every two years now to make sure it's not like causing problems. Like he's not, even his walking isn't too much. So that's like a, again, I could tell lots of stories that, that can overemphasize and over amplify something, but, th but this is very real that happened in my practice. That will help that gentleman to stay healthier and perhaps live longer and That's healthier. That's right. But to your point, it's scary to know that he had that gene. Yeah. But guess what? We have a plan. We have a plan of surveillance. We have a plan of action and he's carrying on. And so, okay. So um, that is a wonderful example. How long do you think it'll take for, some of these great innovations that are starting at the high end of medicine to then uh, pervade throughout the entire society? So, yeah, great question. And so I was involved, I mean, I won't go through the whole story, but I wound up, there's a 40, a small, like probably like $50 billion company called Optum that lives in a $150 billion company called United Health Group. And mm -hmm. I became a fiduciary. So 
they got caught red-handed screwing doctors and patients, the technology arm did, and they were forced by the government to put an oversight board of doctors to make sure that they look at everything they did. So I happened to be, I got invited to the oversight board because I was involved in digital health a long time. And I, they said, well, that, that guy knows you know, stuff. So, so I sat on that board for a while and I became the chief, the, the advisor to the CEO of this small 40, $50 billion company. And he then got tapped to run Medicare by Obama and help craft Obamacare. So he brought me in to that world uh, where I was on the inside of that story. Now, I think what Obamacare, when people hear about it, it's insurance for everybody, pre-existing conditions, blah, blah, blah. Those are all the things, those are the talking points, the things that make the news. Yeah, yeah. But what I was really, really interested in uh, more than anything else is if you look at what I do today. So I'm a little practice in the middle of a couple cities. I charge a fixed fee per year. I'm all in. You pay me X, I'm never gonna charge you anything else. I, your good outcome is my good income because if I do a shitty job of organizing your care and you're calling me and things, the wheels are coming off everywhere, I'm at a fixed dollar amount, which means I will make less per hour <laughs> if I don't really organize your world. But right. now the onus is, now it's my problem to be smart about proactive thinking about you when you're not. And I told the government, the federal government, and, and this is what value-based care is, is how do you take what I do at a micro scale and how do you enable that? Because then there's no transactional elements anymore. Then you've taken the, I make money by keeping people, by killing people slowly, you know, or I make money by, I make more money by writing more prescriptions or doing more things because I just get paid no matter what their outcome is. So you have to tie the outcome to the income. And, and that is one of the core theses that no one really doesn't make the news because it's hard to understand, um, you know, for, for like the average person. But that is happening right now across the entire country where hospitals are being told, you've got five years to figure this out. You got five years, we're going to give you a bucket of money and that's all you get. And what that's going to mean is they're going to have to redesign their entire systems around knowing their patients and outcomes as opposed to just transactions. Um, so my goal, and I've spent a lot of time designing this system here at Private Medical. So you, in our practice, you, there are teams. There are a team of experts and expert teams. And when you hit me, when you call me up with a problem, the way that information flows through me to my team around the medical universe back to you to your wife whoever it is that that is a system design of communication architecture because without good communication architecture and by the way data flow data is the substrate of communication right data flows yeah, over yeah. through communication but if you have great data and shitty communication we're not really where we want to be so you have to design a communication platform and that's where i spend all my time is how do you how do you optimize communications and data so that you're feeling good, I'm feeling good, and we get a good outcome that costs the system less, you're more productive. And, and once you've designed, and it's hard to do, by the way, designing all this stuff, but once you've designed it, and once I've designed it, and I'm, I feel like I'm at a place where it's good enough and I'm getting there, I want to give this blueprint away to free clinics in red states, blue states, to, I want to give, because it's a design problem. It's not a anything else. People just need to like, and then you need to like recraft how you've been doing it and employ design. And a lot of that has to do with technology. So, okay, so let me stop you there for a second because I have two major questions. So uh, the three points I'll make uh, that, there seems to be a lot of expired experience. We read a lot because we're into high performance for luxury executives. We always come across um, data that says that doctors today who are practicing 20, 30, 40 years are not as good at diagnosing because they haven't kept up as some of these uh, young doctors coming out of medical school. So that's one point, keep that in mind. The expired experience question. The second one is if, the, if we gather the data of a patient and we're able to test MRIs, whatever the tests are that diagnose, we're able to diagnose, well, AI might be better at diagnosing, and that's a question really, at diagnosing than many doctors. Or, you know, the doctor might be 98% accurate, the AI might be 97%. So that's another element. I'm asking you a complex question, but I know you'll be able to distill through it. The second thing is then, 
will the AI prescribe? Once the AI diagnosis, will the AI prescribe? And then finally, to kind of bring it all together, and then if that's true, or even partially true, then what is the role of the doctor? And my final point, because you build a lot of emotional intelligence in your, into your practice is, within the role of the doctor, what is the emotional intelligence? How does all of that work? Did I, did I, so remember, okay. let me, me, me soak all that in and try to spit out something that's coherent. Okay, fair so, enough. Yeah, so, I, so um, the first thing I'll say is anything that ends in oscopy or all like, like colonoscopy, um, anything where a camera is involved, AI will always do better than a human. So pathology, radiology, uh, os you know, identifying complex patterns of, of, of pixels, humans can do it pretty good, but AI is definitely gonna augment a physician's ability to understand that in the context of a whole bunch of other things. So okay. humans are ostensibly the most complex thing in the universe, as far as we know. I mean, the immune system, like we, we're scratching the surface here and this pandemic is highlighting how much we don't even know about that with all the AI in the world. So somebody asked me, hey doc, are you concerned? I was at a big JP Morgan healthcare conference and um, with a bunch of investors and, and they said, are you concerned that AI is going to replace you? And I looked at the guy and I said, I would be far more concerned about AI replacing you before AI, I'm concerned about AI replacing me. Um, as a primary care doctor, you're just crunching numbers and all that data exists. We don't even know much about this thing and we're learning in real time. And so like, I think once I'm replaced, the person that's replaced behind me is the priest. So like that's, I feel pretty safe being right in front of the priest because going back to your emotional intelligence piece, humans are not straight lines. And, it, and I can tell you everything about your risk profile. I could use all the AI to tell you everything about your risk. But if I don't know what your risk tolerance is, if I don't know what you care about, if I don't understand that you were beaten as a kid or you had a mother that was a drunk or you got in a car accident and lost your sister, like, or pick the horrible thing that could happen as a kid or pick the non-horrible thing that can happen as a kid, the, you know, that, that like led you to become a certain way in the world um, and how you desire to comport yourself and how you fancy your character is. Like, this is the emotional intelligence piece. Unless I understand that AI is just gonna like fall down every single time because it doesn't know who you are. And so this goes back to the concept of it's not the healthcare system today says, what's the matter with you? And that's what AI and blah, 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 blah. Right. I would say that's, that's only half of the question. It should be what's the matter with you and what matters to you. And you have to then find a way to concatenate those two things to develop a thesis. And by the way, you're changing all the time. Next mm -hmm. week, you're different than you are today and what you believed. So when I do um, end of life uh, living wills and I think what discuss like what, what would happen if you wound up in a car accident and you, so you ask someone at 40, they're gonna have a different answer than when they're 50 and then when they're 60 because they've seen more things, their experience has taught them. So there's this constant iterative updating about who you are. Um, but you asked another question that I wanted to answer. Um, about AI that I well, it was about the role of the doctor and if diagnosis and prescription is being done. By oh, the oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, so to your point about making a diagnosis and a prescription, until you're prepared. So, first of all, everything's probabilistic in medicine. There is no one and zero. It's, mm -hmm. it's. I mean, you can get to one if you do a lot of the diagnostic testing and you get to okay, it's, it's a one and it's not a zero. Most things are in between one and zero. Everything's probabilistic and everything's. But you know, if you have a staph infection, uh, I could give you a hot compress or I could give you antibiotics and each one of the, everything you do has a risk and a benefit. So there's no, it, very few things are black and white. And until you're comfortable saying, I will not sue, I will not create a grievance. I, I absolve myself to file a grievance claim. You're never going to use AI because you can't sue a computer. You can't sue an algorithm. And, and so you have to factor in people's desire to have some agency within when things go wrong. And so you can sue me all day long, you know, and never been sued. Um, and, um, and I can have my algorithms here that help me make a better decision for you. And it's the trust you have in me knowing that I've got your back 
Like I am on your team. I am part of your family. Like if you believe that, you, A, you're never going to sue me. A, you're going to cut me some slack if a mistake happens because like we're, we're operating in a universe of imperfect information. But as long as you know, like we, we put the best things to bear and we made the best decision we could, there's something called an, a, an, a result of a decision. So you can have a high quality decision and a bad result. And in poker, that's called resulting. And if you start to frame up like, oh my God, I got a bad result from that high quality decision. I'm not going to make that high quality decision again. Okay, that you're an idiot because you have to always make the high quality decision knowing that you may get a bad result sometimes. You know, anyway. What you're talking about here, doctor, is exactly what the financial services industry, the luxury goods industry, hospitality industry, everybody should be operating this way, right? Because they're dealing with humans, granted, not on a medical basis, mm -hmm. but the, the construct that you just described is the way everyone should be treating with the operational efficiency and effectiveness but it, and the emotional intelligence of treating everyone like an individual, right? Right. So, so um, Danella Meadows, um, uh, who is an MIT complex systems theorist, and like I'm a geek and I love her work, she wrote a 25-page um, essay called uh, Leverage Points in a Complex System. And I think yeah. of the healthcare system as a very complex system. And she says, you know, how do, you, how do you change a large complex system? Do you change it by changing incentives? Do you change the goals? Do you change the feedback loops? Do you change, I mean, she's got a 11 point hierarchy of how you change. I'm a, a big complex complexity theory geek myself. Okay, well you should go, I'll, I'll send you the, the paper. I read it every quarter. Every quarter it's a half, because I, I constantly have to, I can't forget this. It's too critical for me to forget. And I always think about something slightly different when I read it again because uh, time happened and I, I, I got hopefully wiser. But at the top of her hierarchy is, what is the paradigm of, not the, not the top, this is the second to the top. What is right. the paradigm of the system? Like you have to Tell start with what is the that. paradigm? What is health? You have to ask, you have to answer okay. that question before you can design a system. And right now, and so I, one of my, one of the pre-COVID, I was gonna go interview 50 people and ask them what is health. And, and I'll guarantee you, I'm gonna get 50 different answers. And, and so how do you organize? So, so the number one thing on her pyramid is not what is the paradigm, but is the power to transcend a paradigm to a new paradigm. And, and right. And so how do you, so you, in order to do that, you have to present a model. You have to present a story that people go, God, I want that world. I want to live in that world. So, but how do you describe that world? And so, I mean, I'm, I'm kicking, a, I got a book kicking out in my head around describing a world of what health could look like and should look like as a means to start the conversation of paradigm shifting from like everything we believe today to something that we all kind of want. And, you know, I think it'd be cheaper to do and not more expensive. And high-end medicine is going to lead the way. The wealthy are going to subsidize that system and then right. it'll become mainstream, hopefully. That's and right. will subsidize the poor. Um, but well, I do but, think it all starts there. Yeah. Well, it's interesting is there's a company called Iora Health and a friend of mine started it right around the I know time. Them, I, I know them. I was going to bring them up. Tell, tell them about Iora Health. So Rashika Fernandopol is a, a, a doctor like me. He came out of Harvard Pilgrim. Right. I mean, and he said, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to, there's so much waste in the healthcare system and there's so much shenanigans of process that he said, I'm going to design a healthcare system for the poorest of the poor, the working poor. And so he goes to, he went to Vegas and he found the, the people working in the cafeteria of the casinos, the ones you don't see in the basement. Right. And he said to the casino, how much do you spend on these people here um, for healthcare? And they said, we spend X dollars per, per person per month. And they, they self-insure. So they're not, you know, they, right. they don't have an insurance company. And he said, I'll do it for cheaper. And, and they said, oh yeah? He said, I'll do it for 20% cheaper. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he designed a system, knowing how much money he got, knowing the outcomes he want, he wanted, and he's dealing with people that like, you know, can't read. So what he did is he invested a ton in human capital. Um, the, the, somebody's, the company's called Iora, I-O-R-A, health. Yeah, yeah, um, so. and you I, turned I, me um, on to that a while ago and I did study it. So tell me more, tell us more. So anyway, so, you know, him and I chatted a lot and, you know, he, we, how are you doing at Jordan? How are you, you know, and I said, look, I take care of people that are super high intelligence. And if I explain something to them, like it, it's going to happen. There's not a lot of like trying to under, 
But his challenge was, is he had to get literacy and trust because poor working poor don't trust the healthcare system because every time you go see a doctor, they want to do a pill and then not follow up and then you have a side effect and then you're in the ER. And so there's zero trust at that level. And so what he did is he hired all these other people in the same community that these people trusted and trained them on how to like explain complex things in simple ways. So these are lay people, right? Lay people. So he hired lay people in the same community as the people that didn't trust the healthcare system, got them on his team, got them, trained them on how to like talk to people and get them to recognize that if they didn't control their blood sugar, like they may not be around for their kids. Oh, wow. and, and so he designed an army of coaches and his secret sauce is coaches. Um, and these they people, the last mile. It's the last, the last mile. mile. But guess what? He now employs people that were unemployed and he's oh, giving okay. better health care to the working poor than the people above them get. And he's got, he's publishing a ton of stuff. He's got great outcomes. So I feel like there's like at the high end where I am, at the low end where he is, we're the ones innovating because that's where the, the wealthy want, they want something that feels, you know, professional grade at every level. The poor people don't really know what they want, but there's a guy like Rushika and there's other companies doing the same thing that are going and saying, people are spending so much money on, on a broken system that if you give us less money, we'll design the system to make it better. So it's not so about- It's happening at the top and the bottom. Brilliant, I love that. And so, you know, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, please ask your questions, but um, I do want to ask you one last question. So, sure. um, and, and I'm coming back to COVID. What is your advice? What are the things we need to do to keep ourselves safe? Reiterate them for us, you know, we okay, hear a so, lot of noise. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so real quick, wear a mask all the time. Don't, don't forget. And, and the, the metaphor I'll give, which you, once you hear it, you'll never forget it. And I apologize if it's a little bit X-rated, but, um, but I'm gonna do it anyway, is if two guys are naked and one of them pees on the other guy's leg, how much pee landed on the other guy's leg? 100%. If the guy who's getting peed on wears pants, how much pee landed on his actual leg. And you'd say, well, maybe 50% of the pee got stuck in the pants and 50% of the pee wound up on his leg. If the guy peeing on the guy wears pants and tries to pee on the guy and they're both wearing pants, how much pee got on the other guy's leg? And the answer is zero. And that's why everyone needs to wear a mask. It's, 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 it's vivid, it's vivid. No, it's that's vivid. Really yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so, and it, it makes the point. And, and, you know, I mean, like I just flew to New York um, and I wore a mask. I didn't use the bathroom on the plane. I sat furthest away from the bathroom in a window seat. I didn't eat the food. I didn't take my mask off. <laughs> you know, there are strategies to do stuff. Um, you, you just have to like line them up and actually execute on them. And so, um, you know, the school thing is going to be really hard for. Well, I was going to ask you, should we send our kids to school? Oh my God, that's such a hard one. I think, I think we're going to, and we're going to see schools open and close and open and close and open and close. I think once we get yeah. testing at scale where every kid can walk up, spit in a thing, and those who are positive go home and those who are negative go to school, that's how you're going to get to a more sustainable universe is, is going to be with this rapid, uh, this, you know, uh, testing, saliva testing. Wow, thank you. So Katie, should we open it up for questions? Uh, if not, I have a few more questions left. I, I, there's a question I see here, which is how do you deal with pre-existing conditions, insurance companies with the data to help people stay healthy? So like A, the Affordable Care Act um, was supposed to make it so pre-existing conditions didn't matter. Um, now, they matter because they just charge you more. They, they, can't, they can't deny you insurance. But what I would say is every condition, I mean, we're that, most conditions that people have can be optimized a ton. And, and once you get that under control, you can and should go to your insurance company and, and let them know that I've got this under control. Like, why are my rates still so high? Um, but that's a you know, fighting with an insurance company is like, is like going into a haunted house with with the blinders and earmuffs and you can't see or hear anything and then they've got like these big clubs and, and you've got like a feather so it's hard um but but you you sometimes you gotta like don quixote your way into it and and fight that fight so uh you obviously when you went into the mandarin oriental going back to your origins um you did you know you eventually 
nailed it because I know that your one of your executives, maybe several of them, come from the uh, hospitality industry, the luxury hospitality industry. So you wanted to not only have the great medical, let's say, innovations and practices, but you also wanted the emotional intelligence. How are you able to scale that across your clinics? Who do you find? What do you do? How how do you create that culture that provides that emotional care? Well, you know, a great question. I mean, we're a 90 person company now and, you know, it all starts with leadership. It all starts with don't just say it, do it. And so, and then you have to repeatedly live what you preach. And I, I only have one speed. I have one gear. <laughs> Some people can't stand it cause I go kind of fast, but, I but, I, I, <laughs> but, but you'll, but, but what you see is what you get here. There's not a lot of, other things going on in my mind. I, you'll hear them when I say them. Like, I didn't like say something I didn't think. Um, and, you know, I, I brought up my first, you know, 10 hires that I brought in, um, you know, some of them didn't operate in the same speed and they stuck out like a sore thumb. And so they didn't stay. And so ultimately it's the culture, we call it the culture of care. And we have a number of um, pillars that we hold each other accountable to. And I think about I think about creating not an organization, but an organism. And organizations have siloed departments. But organisms, if you look at a cell, you don't. It's like there's this, and if one part of the cell gets injured, every other part of that cell goes to help it because they're affected by it. But in an organization, if the finance department's having problems, like the medical department may never know. And, and they, they can't even know to help, or they can't even know what their role in it that caused the problem. So by opening up the channels of communication to everybody can know everything kind of this radical transparency and there's a culture of care where everybody wants to like help like it, it self heals it it, it it you know people want to solve and it, things can't spin too far out of control and anybody that becomes an outlier sticks out like a sore thumb so it's it's got to be cultural it, you know culture each strategy you can't write a book and say this is how your company you have to live it and you have to go talk to the people and build it fair enough now, there's two more questions. So Jackie is asking on shifting from a transaction to values-based service and using more data and AI to diagnose, what is happening on eliminating bias to make sure that treatment is fair and not transactional, uh, transactional from years of habit? So how do you eliminate the well, bias? So it's a great question. And every doctor that we hire and every nurse that we hire, um, we tell them you're smart, like they're, they're all high EQ, high IQ, empathic, altruistic. Like they have to meet a certain test of like a character, right? But then mm -hmm. I tell them, you know, you're going to have, before I can teach you the private medical way, you have to, uh, you have to be willing to unlearn all these things that you've learned. And you have to embrace the concept of intellectual humility. And the preeminent nugget of intellectual humility is what you believe is not who you are. What you believe is a hypothesis and it could be wrong. And if you're shown that it's not right, you should embrace that you just learned something that was right rather than feel like you were told that you were wrong and your ego now hurts and you feel bad and you thought everything you knew, you were really smart because you knew that. So we try to infuse the, and there's a, Shane Snow wrote a whole great article on intellectual humility that I ask people to read because I really want them to understand. I reread it again. It's like a 30 minute read, but if you read it and don't understand it, like, I don't know that you can work here. Like, because you have to be able to recognize that as smart as you are and the habits that you've gotten into, we do it differently. And, and, and we're going to disabuse some of these things. We're going to reteach you. So you have to be willing to learn new things. You have to be willing to want to be wrong and embrace that what you believe is, is you know, just a hypothesis. And there's another question coming in from Ellen about uh, your thoughts about general concierge medical companies. Uh, I won't name any, but how do you feel about the state of that concierge medicine? There's different models, but yeah. how do you feel about that? So, um, so because I started uh, this practice in 1998 with a concierge, um, I am often thought of as the grandfather or the father of concierge medicine, because I'm the one who like, I've helped hundreds of doctors around the country start these practices. Because I did it because I wanted them to have better lives. They were all in the salt mines, getting abused by insurance companies, yelled at by patients, 
people were holding on to their five dollar copay like it was the last thing in their world because they and they did it because there was no value. People didn't see the value of giving you five bucks. You have to wait in line and then wait in your waiting room and then you know w wait in the exam room and then get five minutes. Like, and meanwhile, I'm doing house calls to the manager. People give me five hundred bucks cash and happy about it all day long. So, what I would say is is um, most concierge practices, and I'm a big fan of them. I don't consider myself a concierge practice. Um, I consider myself private medicine. So different category, kind of another level. But yeah. most concierge practices have not unlearned. What they're doing is the same thing they've always done, which is reactive medicine. It's not proactive. They wait for you to call them, but you like it because they answer the phone and they spend as much time with you as you want. And that's great. Like that's better than what exists. So, so it's, but, but what we do is we're thinking about you all. We, we have meetings every week, three times a week, and we go over our people and we check in with them and we we're organizing their whole lives and we're thinking about things that they're not thinking about and trying to get them to think about those things. And so I, I think that the trend was to, you know, better access. So access and time are table stakes for me, but, but for a lot of people, like that's a, a bonus. I'll pay 10 grand a year to get like a great doctor and access to a, a private ER or something like that. But like, ultimately you don't want to go to the ER. Like I, there are 99 ways to not go to the ER, but you need someone to hold your hand and someone who knows you and to convince you that you don't. Um, so, so I think concierge medicine is good. I'm, I'm a big promoter of it. I think it, it's, 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 it's got a lot of evolution to go, but it's a great first step, and I'm I'm a big fan of it. But you are far beyond that. I, I can acknowledge that. Well, so, so we, we also, like I said earlier, so we, we have internal medicine, pediatrics, gynecology, cardiology, um, uh, naturopathic medicine. So we're a big platform. You 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 come into us and 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 you get the your whole family. You sign your family up. You're done. And you know that we're going to help you avoid ERs. We'll make house calls. We're available by email, text, and phone, twenty four seven we're on your team and, and, and we're really part of your family. Um, we're, we're not just some vendor, like, and by the way, you can fire us and we can fire you. And we fire people that think we're just a vendor. Like we're not interested in your money. Like that's, we're, we're, in this for, we're in this for a long-term relationship. Yeah. We, we want to feel fulfilled as physicians and as everybody who works here. So Jordan, we're coming to the end because um, we, I, I, I could speak to you for hours. And I think I look, looking at all the people who stayed, uh, I think they could listen and learn for hours. Final word on um, on medicine, where you see it going. What what's the last word on that? I, I think the last word is is you know seventy percent of doctors right now are doing Zoom meetings in the country, if not the world, and and that didn't exist before. Nobody would do that because nobody would pay for it. Insurance companies would not pay for a Zoom meeting, and and so I think that that everybody who's um, uses Amazon uses Uber, uses any technology where they press a button and things happen, they're now starting to look full screen at why is healthcare full of resistance circuits? How come they haven't done any of thing? And the reason is, is there's a lot of money to be made in keeping it status quo. All these big companies that have big buildings that they have to pay rent on, they must make you come in for the visit. Um, otherwise, like what are the buildings doing? So I think that a lot of medical buildings are going to turn into housing um, for, for the poor and you'll, they'll get medical care there. I think that's a 10 year trend. And I think that we're going to see the, the wave of technology breach fortress medicine walls finally um, in ways that it should. I love it. Dr. Jordan Schlein, you're a pioneer and you are a fascinating speaker and a sharer of knowledge and I love your goodwill and your stories. And I look forward to having another conversation on this. Very yeah, soon. and if anybody, if anybody wants to reach out and you know, there's a, yeah, you can see that here. And oh, there's one thing that's not on here that just, this is a, I write um, every month a 40 page um, detailed comprehensive dispatch on COVID, um, which is no politics and all science where I go over. I read it, religious. Yeah, you've seen it. And, and, it's, and if you go to jordansdispatch.com, you can sign up for it. Um, I'm going to write the next one in the next week. I'm, I've been working on it for the last week. Um, but it's really, if you want to crawl inside my brain philosophically and scientifically to see where, where I'm thinking about this stuff, that's where you can find it. And I'll we'll send you. it out. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Schlain. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of August right. and be safe. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Have you. a nice day. Thank you. Ciao.